I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and co-owner of PurePleasureShop.com. I'm April, VP of the cutting-edge sex toy company Hot Octopus, and I dedicate my life to the business of sex. We are on a mission to teach you how to have hot sex, deep intimacy, and how to make your own rules for who you are as a sexual being. Welcome Welcome to to the the Shameless Sex Revolution. Want to learn more? Go to shamelesssex.com. And for 50% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use code SHAMELESSSEX at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Shameless Sex Podcast. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Woohoo, me too. And today, well, okay, so fun story about this episode. It's not really that fun of a story, but um, <laughs> I knew about his podcast, which, what was the name of it? So it's now called the Relationship School Podcast. Jason Gaddis, he's also now an author. He works with people. Probably, he does all kinds of things. Um, his podcast was called, oh, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. Couples. So, the, cu- the Couples Podcast? Uh, it's any and yeah, I'm, we I I think we said it in the episode. Yeah, we do. And he talked about changing. He changed the yeah, the, the rebranded. Branding, yeah. Yes. And I used to listen to it because I loved some of the advice he gave. In fact, after my last breakup, where I was like kind of feeling so really attached and and stuck, like I couldn't let go of the tethers. He had a guest on there, and the way they spoke about attachment and relationships, and I I think one of the the tips this person gave is like when. When you know, you know that it's over and sometimes you need to go and do this thing over and over and over again to know. And I was like, oh, and it really impacted me. And anyways, um, I'm really excited that we got to have him on our show and we're going to guest on his show. And he's coming out with a book. Hey, it's, it's called <laughs> Getting to Zero, How to Work Through Conflict in Your High Stakes Relationships. Actually should be out sometime around when this podcast is released, sometime in October of 2021. That's right. Uh, before we dive into that, it's very exciting. Um, I will do one last announcement. I do have an in-person workshop coming up here in Santa Cruz. I could see you in person. Well, you do right now because I'm right here with you in oh. front of you. But you could also come in person and learn from me in person. Can and I play. heavy pet you? You can heavy pet me, but you can't touch my genitals or my nipples because that's not part of this uh, well, class. Well, I'm not going. All okay. right. So fine. She's out. So she's not invited <laughs> anyway. So uh, it's on October 16th. That's a Saturday, 2021. It's called Whole Body Foreplay Heavy Petting 101. And it involves learning all about foreplay with the entire body using presence and play. But we're not talking genitals. We're not talking nips. We are talking about all of these secondary and non-erogenous zones. Although some people can say even your elbow is an erogenous zone. And you are correct. Um, it is from 6 to 9 p.m. And you can sign up at purepleasureshop.com. Dot com. If you just go to the sex ed, online sex ed part, uh, you can sign up there. We have a limited amount of uh, seats, and there's no seats actually, so space. And you have to come with another person to play or practice with, just so you know. Um, and we've had the question, can I bring two people to practice with? Yes, you can. Good for you. You're having lots of fun. Uh, all right, so that's my little announcement there. Where do you there. sign up for it? At purepleasureshop.com. Where was that again? I'm also known as the sex shop that I own with my mom. We sell sex toys. They have loop. incredible sex toys. Yep. And I want to give a shout out. And Janice, happy 70th birthday. We love you so much. Thank you for birthing this beautiful human, Amy Marie Baldwin, that's over me. here. And for being born. And support Janice. And the Pure Pleasure Shop is how I got my start. Yeah. In this industry, how I learned about sexuality was through Amy and Janice. And go to purepleasureshop.com and you can save some moolah. Yeah, with 50, you get 15% off with coupon code SHAMELESSSEX. And just think of it as a birthday present to my mom. Happy birthday, mom. You Thank can send you. her some stuff, I guess. Yeah, you, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> send her some thanks. I won't give you her address, but uh, send me an email if you want to send my mom She lives thing. at www.purepleasureshop.com. <laughs> <laughs> mom is the best mom in the whole world. Okay, ready for a sex question? I believe show. I believe this is from a vulva owner. And vulva owner says, I think, my partner keeps asking what I want and what are my fantasies. And I, to be honest, have no idea what they are. I just really like sex. I do want to try different things and be more assertive in bed, but I have no idea what these things are. And I'm afraid he will get bored and annoyed with me answering that I'm unsure about these things. He hates it when I say, I don't know. What do you want? Also, he wants me to come while we are having penetrative sex, but it just doesn't seem to happen. And then I get into my head and it plagues my mind a bit and it affects the enjoyment level, enjoyment level. I've heard you talk about this on one of your podcasts, but I'm still unsure if maybe I'm doing something wrong. Please help. 
It's two questions there. Well, I, I want to just shed my piece of advice right here is that my piece of advice is you're not doing anything wrong. No. And everyone comes differently. And some people come differently at different times in their lives. So you may not be able to come with penetrative sex right now. You may never be able to come with penetrative sex right now. And that's okay. However... Nothing's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you at all. Yeah, so we'll stick to that one first so that the secondary question, that is, we've talked about this so many times. There's so much research about this and uh, the idea of a penis and a vagina and that the penis and the vagina is supposed to give the orgasm to the vagina owner um, and if they don't, there's something wrong, um, is bullshit. And a lot of the ways the penis is touching the, the vagina generally, um, it, especially if they learn from porn, is a lot of thrusting. It's missing a lot of the parts where there are the nerve endings, which is the clitoris, which is the labia, which is mostly the external stuff. It's not the internal stuff. Not to say that people can't have wonderful internal pleasure. A lot of people do. Um, and we can learn all kinds of different ways, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. And so your partner really wants you to come this way. I feel for your partner. That's cool. That sounds really nice. And that's a lot of pressure. And that's not your job to fulfill their fantasy so they feel really good that you had an orgasm in that way. And it's also not your partner's fault that they think that that's how sex should be. And I don't know if they're shaming you or not, but you it sounds like you're taking this on as your own. And this isn't your job to do. Absolutely not. And that, that's, that's, too much, much, that's too much pressure. That's way too. And then you know what pressure does is to sex and orgasm? Brr. Also, if you can, if you know the ways you can come as a vulva owner, if you most typically orgasm from clitoral stimulation. Which you, most do. Which most do. The percentage of folks that orgasm with penetration is, it's less than 20% of people. So of vulva owners. Of just penetra yeah, penetration alone. Alone. Yeah. So I, with, with myself, and I can speak for myself, I typically, if I'm being penetrated, I use a sex toy on my vulva. So my external bits, meaning my clitoris, because I require clitoral stimulation. And typically then if a penis is inside of me, or a toy, uh, and I have a toy outside and inside, I, I will not always orgasm because every time is different. However, it does a lot of times help me with arousal and uh, a lot of times will I can still orgasm. Just using my hand alone with a uh, penis inside of me usually doesn't help me orgasm. Yeah. And for some it feels fine, but yeah. it's just not enough for I, me. I'm a, I mean, the sex toys I, are I, my go-tos. I love vibrators and my partner and I will play with these moments of me just using the sex toy and then the, his cock will be inside of me or maybe it's at the same time, but it just depends on my, and it's different every day. Some days my body is like, I will get off to this vibrator in one minute. And some days my body's like, it's going to take 20 minutes. Some days it's, I want your cock inside me at the same time. Some days it's like, your cock needs to be on the other side of the room and I want to watch you stroke it while it's happening. This is why it's cool. Humans are so, if, we're always evolving. It's also a fucking pain in the ass because <laughs> sometimes I'm like, oh, God there's damn no it. There's no perfect blueprint. Yes, there's not. And it, 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 it's so variable and there's so many variations of sexuality, which makes it exciting. However, if this person wants to try, and if you haven't tried a sex toy, that might be uh, one layer of a of yeah, a solution. And if if it doesn't work, that's okay too. And if your uh, partner is really into having you orgasm, uh, perhaps w with penetration, you you could also really really warm up yourself a lot before, so you're almost at the level of orgasming, and then. Uh, penetration could happen and then perhaps you may be able to orgasm. Or your partner can learn more about how to touch your body and I know, so that brings us to the first question, which before we get to the first question, actually this is part of the first question, is something we talk about on this podcast all the time, which is OMGS. It's OMGS.com. Ooh, good one. OMGS yeah. has two different seasons. The first one is all about external pleasure. It's all about vulvas. So they show all these different videos, techniques, categories on ways that you can learn to pleasure yourself with your hands externally and how to have orgasms. And how and, many people? Uh, 20,000? 20,000. All right. I always get it wrong. I was like, it. it's like 79 million. <laughs> uh, it's 20,000 women it identified uh, vulva owners, 18 to 95 real live Humans. human beings. And then season two is internal pleasure. So this is how they have the orgasms via internal pleasure with hands and, and various touches. Season three will be about using sex toys. But here, so here's the thing. For yourself, when your partner says, what do you like? And you're like, I don't really know. You could go watch OMGS 
And you buy it one time. You get to watch it unlimited times. And you buy the season separately. It's not a subscription. You learn and you go and practice. You go and practice and these, you discover what does my body like? What kind of touch? What kind of turns me on? What gets me excited? What gets me going? And then you can share that with your partner. You could also have your partner watch this to learn and be like, hey, this one thing worked for me really well. Can you replicate that? I want to talk about some of the things that they have identified as some of their collections of ways to stimulate. There's shallowing. There's Ooh. Renewing, Ooh. there's deep end, squirting, we've heard of, adding. So all of these things, adding is more pleasure through stretch and fullness. Ooh. There's all of these different, te it's techniques. Yeah, and, and everyone's different. Like you said, like everyone's so different in terms of what they like. So you can go and discover what works for you and then share this with them. And guess what? You also get 10% off when you go to omgs.com slash shameless and you can go and learn some things and share it with your partner. And this isn't just for this person with this sex question. Anyone that wants to go and enhance their orgasms or learn about their body or admires a vulva. And so going to the first part of the question about what are my fantasies? What do you want? What do you like? You said, I have no idea. I just like sex. So I I'm I feel you cuz I feel the same way still sometimes at this, these moments like I'll have moments where I'm like I don't even know what I want right now and I've in the past had no idea what my body wanted or what my fantasies were. And so we just gave you some ideas on how you could figure out more about like exactly how to touch your body with hands and the whole thing about your partner wanting you to have an orgasm with penetrative sex. Um, maybe by learning more about what your body likes by including the external stimulation. So like what OMG has to show you about like clitoris, et cetera, might get you there during that. And also that could just be more about what you like in, in terms of having sex. And really, honestly, a lot of heterosexual sex these days does involve a lot of warm up and a lot of foreplay and a lot of time. It's like, I, you know, they don't show that in porn. And so your partner touches you for three minutes. Your body's not there. The penis gets aroused. What is it, like four times faster than the vulva? And so just because the penis is ready doesn't mean that you're ready. So if the penis is ready in five minutes, 20 minutes of time for your pussy to maybe get on board for penetration and then still adding clitoral stimulation. But coming back to what you want, those are some things about the clitoris. I suggest, like April said, trying sex toys, fantasies, put some thought into it. Listen to more podcasts. See what turns you on. Listen to a kink podcast. Listen to a podcast on Tantra. Um, just see like what really, I don't know. And maybe you don't, maybe you're not in a full yes to it. Listen but to erotica. Erotica. Yeah. Like Dipsy. You yeah. know, we've talked about this. Make a yes, no, maybe list of things that this, I'm a yes to this because I listened and learned about this. I'm a no to this. That's a hard no. And I'm a maybe to try in this. And so it, maybe if you come into it with just this like drawn out thing, you won't draw a blank when they ask you because you've given in some time but I know that in the moment when we're naked and they're like what do you like what do you want I too that gets stage where I'm like I don't know just try some things uh, that's when I like to tap into what feels good I like the feeling of your skin on my body right now yeah I like I, I try to drop in because I am terrible as great as I am at sometimes talking about fucking nothing where I'm like hey blah, 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 at the person it's something at the it's always something it's always something yeah. but sometimes I, I make some some small talk but when I really tap into just what the sensation is mm -hmm. what I'm experiencing I love the way you smell right now yeah I love the feeling of your hand just touching my hair or I don't or, know what you want but let me can you maybe just try moving your hand down a little further or deeper or try a little more pressure I'm not sure but maybe it's try or I want you or, to talk dirty to me yeah uh, yeah, oh, I want to. Or maybe you're like, talk about, do you know, do you know, uh, onomatopoeias? <laughs> Can you just say all of them that you know? Does right that now? turn you on? <laughs> <laughs> all right, anyways, so yeah, I would say, uh, like, what, as what we're saying, go do some more research with yourself, then bring it to your partner and share, teach, educate, learn together. There's so many ways to do that um, and get rid of the pressure as much as possible. Invite your partner to. Um, deflate that pressure because that is not helpful. You want to onomatopoeia is now? <sighs> it's not a palindrome. I know no. that. Palindrome? No. <laughs> Sizzle. It's an onomatopoeia. And a palindrome is taco it, cat. <laughs> so Yeah, something that's spelled frontward and backward the same. And or, wow. onomatopoeia <laughs> is something that's... Yes. And also, Dad. Dra very good. Uh, we're going to change up this episode now to... No, onomatopoeia is something that sounds like it's... Uh, oh. So it's like sizzle and... I don't know. Um, I can't think of any more right now. But like, oh, uh, maybe wow. <laughs> 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 Is it palindrome and an onomatopoeia? Yeah, it's all of them. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, are you ready for Jason Gaddis's bio? Yes, please. All right. That was good. That was a really cool uh, sex question. Noise. Thank you for writing in, listener. Jason Gaddis is an author, relationship expert, and coach who teaches people the one class they didn't get in school, how to do relationships. Jason leads one of the most in-depth and comprehensive relationship trainings and trains coaches from all over the world on how to be relationship coaches. Jason has thousands of fans and followers across multiple channels. He's the host of the Relationship School podcast and has they have over 5 million downloads and over 330 episodes. He is also the visionary behind the Relationship School. His book, Getting to Zero, will be out in fall of 2021. But first... You know we love shamelessly talking about sex, but we also know that sometimes your sex life can fall into a dull routine. That's why we love to think outside the box by getting a fun, sexy box from Like a Kitten. Like a Kitten will ship you a gift box with all your erotic essentials, from vibrators and massage oils to robes and handcuffs. It's the perfect solution to spice things up and help make your sex life bright and shiny. And right now, they're helping you choose your own adventure with their Build Your Own Box. You choose one item out of each of their six categories. Toys, beauty products, lubes, games, sexy accessories, and even lingerie. We love the Like a Kitten BYOB because you can build an experience that's customized to your specific desires. And it's only $69. Some of the vibrators alone retail for more than $69, but you're getting the entire box of goodies for that price. Plus, right now, Like a Kitten is offering our listeners 20% off and free shipping when you go to likeakitten.com slash shameless or enter code shameless at checkout. Just go to likeakitten.com slash shameless or use code shameless to get 20% off these incredible boxes. Likeakitten.com slash shameless. The link is in the episode's description. Go check it out. Meow. All right. It's interview time. All right, everyone, it is interview time, and we are here with Jason Gaddis. Did I say it right, Gaddis? Yes. You I got did. it. Woo! Oh. Um, who I was actually just telling Jason, I, we April and I have known about Jason's podcast for a long time, uh, have been big fans, and I've actually learned a number of things about relationships, some things actually that uh, changed my life many years ago, um, which we can talk about later, because it's all about me. And, um, and so we're super excited to have you here. You have a book coming out, so you are author of Getting to zero how to work through conflict in your high stakes relationships coming out in october 2021 that's when this will be released but maybe you're listening to this in 2050 i don't know and how's the water levels in the world i don't know are we still (laughs) in climate change it's real okay anyways (laughs) so jason welcome to our show first of all we're very excited to have you here thank you and i want to get the names right amy and april April. yeah 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 I know when you we, right. we had to call you had to call us and you're like Ashley we're like well it's an A name but you're close Amanda Amanda, Amanda. Allison yeah Allison right exactly yeah my bad Ariana yeah okay. that was good I I'll liked go it by all of them cool so thanks for being flexible yeah we're open or sometimes people call us the Amys or the Aprils it's just yeah. Yeah, shorten it so uh, it. we always start with the same prompt for our guests and so I'll give you the same exact prompt so can you tell us how you got to where you are today specifically in the field of love and relationships. Hell yeah. I was a sensitive, emotional, empathic boy and got trained out of that by the boy code and learned to protect myself and not show anyone emotions or feelings or any of that sort of soft, tender stuff. And then that kind of fucked me up when I got into relationships in my 20s because I turned into an emotionally unavailable guy. So all the women that I dated were wanted in to the heart, right? And I didn't know how and I just kind of pushed them away because they were making me feel bad. And as soon as I got space from them, I felt better. And um, so I concluded it must be them, right? It must be you. And enough failures kind of had me wake up. And I was like, shit, maybe I'm the problem. And when I realized that at age 29, I set to work on myself, went to grad school, studied psychology, and just was a beast about learning about relationships and love because I wanted to figure it out because I was a mess. Mm-hmm. I could relate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and the book that you have uh, titled, so Getting to Zero, because I want to break down the title a little bit, also sure. about the high stakes relationships, because I'm like, hmm. But so, so the book title, which Amy already read, How to Work Through Conflict in Your High Stakes Relationships. Can you define not only what a high stakes relationship could be, is it, are all relationships yep. high stakes? Could you also talk about uh, what you mean by the conflict and zero? 
Yeah, hell yeah. So high stakes, first of all, let's start there. That's your inner circle. And that's usually an intimate partner. It's a business partner. It's probably the two of you, high stakes, right? Uh, you know each other. Yeah. There's a lot in the line if something goes badly here. Uh, family relationships as well. Those are high stakes relationships because the you know there's a lot on the line if it doesn't go well. And conflict, I define as a rupture, a disconnection, or a uh, unresolved issue between two people. And getting to zero is the place that we feel happy and good and connected again. And anything above a zero is I start to get triggered out of that place. And I start to disconnect from you and myself. And 10 is like, I am livid, super triggered. Uh, and I want to get back down to zero. Okay. So I'm going to ask this question, which uh, actually was saved for later, but I'm going into it right now about triggers right away, because um, I think we, a lot of, so we use the word triggered often. I also like the word activated, but can you, for listeners who've never, they don't know what triggered is, can you share with them what that means? And then, you know, what do you do? It, what are some ways that partners can help with um, their partner's triggers? And like, what is, you know, what does that look like? And what if you're really triggered by them, you yourself? So what are triggers in general? And how do you deal with them? Yeah, I mean, it's a big question, but I'll start with, I like to think we're social mammals because we are, and we have a scared animal living inside of us that if it's not relaxed, I'm going to have not as great of a connection with you. And even sexuality gets compromised, right? When I'm feeling tense and self-protective. And so triggered is anything that triggers us or activates us into a place where our scared animal is now on guard and on alert. And that could be super on guard, like the fight, flight, freeze thing. I call it seek, avoid, collapse, or posture. That's kind of the, we disconnect in these four main ways. And so then the work becomes, okay, I'm triggered and you're triggered and, and we're not connected anymore and we're at odds and our scared animals are like, you know, flaring up like porcupines. How do we calm ourselves down and how do we calm the other person down and how do we get back to a good place again, which is zero? Can you say like so seek avoid? What was that again? Seek avoid. Posture collapse. Po posture. Collapse. Okay, good, cool. You've got some yeah. good information right here. I feel yeah. like I'm in your old podcast, or now it's not an old podcast; it's new. But when it was called the Smart Couple Podcast, because yeah. I had listened to several episodes of that. Now the relationship's um, cool, but the relationship piece is really cool, and uh, not to sidetrack. So. You, you, I want to like soak up all the information. I'm glad this is say being what you recorded. Do with the triggers, I know the triggers. What yes. do we do with them? Okay. No, no, sorry, I'm so, jumping ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's two things here. I've got to learn how to be with my own triggers, or I'm going to farm that out to you. And if you don't know how to be with your triggers or mine, that's not going to go very well. So all adults need to learn how to be with their own activation and pain. That's strong emotions, that's sensations ripping through our body, that's feelings of discomfort. So it's very good to learn how to be with that stuff because it's uncomfortable, right? And most of us distract, medicate, avoid, do all kinds of things, but feel the stuff in here. So I meditation, I have a simple meditation. I could teach that, but it might take a bit. Um, and how do we deal with the other person's triggers? Again, I, I treat them as a scared animal, or I like to see sometimes them as a hurt little boy or girl or kid. And it's like, oh, you're struggling over there and you're just upset whether you're posturing, collapsing, seeking, or avoiding, you're upset. And how can I behave in a way that calms you down and helps you come out of your scared animal into the front part of your brain so you can make, actually make sense again and we can figure this out. And lots of tools. I can listen until you feel understood. I can put my hand on your leg. I can scoot up close to you in a non-threatening way. I can actually give you space if that works better for you um, as long as there's a return time. So there's a lot of things we need to co-learn together about each other's nervous systems and scared animals so that we can get back to zero again. Is that when you became, become, because you use the term relationship leader, when you're able to achieve these things in a relationship, does that mean you're making it to this relationship leader or am I in totally off base with that? Because I, I no, had a relational leader. Yeah, you're, you're really close. A relational leader isn't, isn't someone who somehow gets beyond triggers. Like we're all going to, again, because we're animals, that's going to happen for the rest of our lives and conflict's going to happen the rest of our lives. What we need to do is be a leader in conflict and learn how to manage and handle ourselves and the other person. And when we do that, we're moving into a leadership seat. We're not letting the scared animal who's really in the back seat with the steering wheel driving the car all over the place, right? Or shutting down or whatever. We've got to come back into the front part of our brain, which is the leader, so that we can you know, make sense, work through it, listen better, speak more effectively. 
Yeah. It's so hard though when you're triggered, when I'm triggered, yeah. because I have oh a very, like, the, it's, it's, I do realize, and in my adult self, that I'm at my lowest self, I'm triggered, and I act out, and it could be, and, yeah. and for, for whatever reason, the dynamic in my relationship now, we tend to trigger each other. And then when we're in that state and we're both activated, it's just like a lash out, a lash out, a lash out. Yeah. And then it's so hard. And then it's like we can't get to the repair because we're both so wounded in what, what, what the state is. So so it's like, it's so hard to apply that. And I'm sure like meditation has helped me, but like if you're in that moment and you're triggering each other, is it like a walk away thing or deciding that before laying out the, the basis before of what the plan is? Yeah. Good question. I mean, I'd be curious what works for you. Cause, and I, I love that you use the word repair. Cause that's really what we're after here is can we see to uh, set up agreements ahead of time so that if you're going to take space or the walk away thing, like you suggested, there's a return time because for some nervous systems, walking away is even more triggering. That's even more threatening, right, to, to some of our nervous systems. So we have to know our person and go, okay, walking away, leaving the room, slamming the door, not cool. But if I leave the room and I say, I'm not go going anywhere, I love you, and I'm coming back, but I need space, and then I can leave. And I'll be back tomorrow morning. I'll be back in two hours. I'll be back in 10 minutes. Then when I'm calmed down, because I'm not effective right now. Right. And it's really not about not getting triggered because we all act a little differently when we're in those moments and in that chunky, crunchy space. And we do blame and we point the finger and we, that's human nature. It's how quickly can we move from that to, oops, I messed up. My bad. Not cool. I see that I hurt your feelings. I raised my voice. I was a jerk. How can we get back to a better place here? What is it? I think it's the the John Gottman who says um, that if w one person in the relationship is triggered, and I, I know you're, you're speaking to all kinds of relationships. I'm sure most people are listening for more like partnerships with couples and um, sure. lovers and things like that. Um, but I think this applies to a lo all relationships, right? Is if one person's triggered, you can't really do very much until you work through that trigger, right? And there, it's like the, there isn't a lot of processing or connection or communication can happen until people have lowered their um, not, I guess, lower the systems, but got, got reconnected back with their bodies and out of their minds. Do you agree with that, that you need to really do that first before you can actually go into connection? For optimal living, hell yeah, and optimal health, definitely. And, you know, my parents' generation didn't have these tools, and so they learned to compartmentalize, and their zero is like a four, and they never dealt with it, and there, there was no repair, and it was just like you suck it up and you let time take care of it. And so, believe it or not, some people can actually live in a pretty compromised state f for a long time because that's the water they're swimming in and they don't know any different, but that's not my, my standard. And I, I encourage people to get way lower down to z closer to zero that actually feels really relaxed. And like, I feel safe again with you and we can open our bodies to each other. We can open our hearts to each other again. Mm -hmm. Well, that will hinder sex too. So yeah. what is, what does the scale yeah. go? Zero is we're calm and at zeros the, we're good you know, and connected. Okay. 10 is uh -huh. ultra triggered. 11 is like parasympathetic dorsal vagal dive. We don't even need to talk about that. That's like a life threatening murder kind of mm -hmm. situation. Oh, oh geez. Oh, wow. oh my God. Scary stuff. And Nervous is this system very does much, else. okay. Is this very much related to childhood wounding in the way this is showing up in people and their, the, the, the lack of work that they may have done on that? Yes, and. So the and is, yeah, we all have our history, and that's going to impact how we're showing up relationally now and how we do conflict or how it was done to us and how it was modeled to us is usually what I call a relational blueprint. It's sort of, that's what we do, and that's how we're going to behave unless we decide to apply ourselves and upgrade it, you know? Um, and uh, the and is, what was my and? Uh, yes, and. So yes, it is related to childhood wounding and... Oh, and or, 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 yeah, even, yeah. It, even if you two had perfect childhoods and so did I and we were all in a relationship and everything was going great, uh, we're still going to trigger each other because we're social mammals and we perceive threats to safety on any given moment and through our social engagement system. So there might be a look on your face that I had a perfect childhood, but the look on your face feels uncomfortable for me. It feels judgy and it feels threatening. So you know, that might trigger me and it has nothing to do with my past. So it's, it's kind of a both. Mm -hmm. 
I want to speak to something because some folks out there, and I, I used to be one of these people that I was sort of a pleaser, so I never would yeah. speak up. And when I was triggered, I would just kind of sit with it by myself. And then it would, I would in, in relationship, it would come out. It would like I would snap like a like a mm. like a twig. It would take a uh-huh. long time because yeah. I was taught never to stir the pot, never to uh, you know. Th- it was, it was, I was avoidant really about conflict yeah. and, and my mom still does it. And I see where I get it when I talk to her, I'm like, Hey, can we, because a, a <laughs> conflict doesn't have to be this angry disagreement. You can have conflict right. and still resolve it in a way that is healthy. And this is, I think part of being an adult, we're, we're conscious beings uh, with a lot of emotions, as you said, and our experiences are always coming out. So I'm speaking to folks out there that uh, I, I've heard that we never fight. We're in a relationship. We never fight. I'm like, but if you do, you yeah. yeah, do you have the tools <laughs> exactly. to talk about it? Because there's no way that you're never triggered. There, that is Im- nearly impossible. I think so. As a human, as a conscious mammal, is that what you call uh, call a us? social mammal? Social mammal. Social mammal. Conscious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so I just wanted to speak Working to that a little bit. Working towards consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So ta- talking about the inner conflict and the outer conflict too, can you talk about that a little bit as well, the difference between those two yeah. things? For sure. I mean, you said it a little bit there where you used to be conflict avoidant, right? And maybe had a hard time using your voice or w- withdrew sometimes when it got scary. And so when you do that, whenever any of us avoids conflict, we actually create a new conflict inside of us between what we want to say, right? And what our truth is and like what's actually going on inside. It's like, it feels bad. So most, most of us grew up feeling, getting the message that some part of us wasn't welcome. So we kind of stuffed it and that's the inner conflict. There's a, there can be a big inner conflict in there between who I actually am, my true self, I call it, or your strategic self, which which is who you are when you're trying to get everybody's love and attention and approval. And that rift between the two selves creates, I think, depression and anxiety. It doesn't feel good, you know? Mm. Um, And then outer conflict is just what, it's the everyday stuff that we disagree about. We don't see eye to eye with. We, um, We have distance. You have, you know, there's a seeker and avoider in a partnership. The avoider... And that silence actually can create conflict in a seeker, right? And someone who's wanting connection, the other person's withdrawing, that f- that's conflict, even though there's no like fighting going on. So there's a lot of flavors, I guess I should say, to conflict. Okay, time for a quick break. This podcast is free to you because of our wonderful sponsors like Dipsy. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories designed to get you lost in a world where pleasure is the only priority. Listen to short audio stories that can turn you on no matter what you're into. From stories that are romantic to wild, or threesomes to couples, even queer to straight, you can immerse yourself in any scenario so you feel like you're right there. Plus, they release fresh content every week, so there's always something new and exciting to explore. I love Dipsy, not only for their endless hot erotic stories, but they also have wellness sessions to help you wind down and relax. Choose your favorite soundscape to drift off to or listen to a sensual bedtime story. I'm here to tell you that you'll love going to bed with Dipsy. And for our listeners, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash shameless. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash shameless. Dipsystories.com slash shameless. Go check it out. This podcast was also made possible by Uberlube. It's a luxurious silicone lubricant that enhances sex and intimacy. We receive emails from listeners who have tried Uberlube and the feedback is unanimous. We never knew lube could be this good. It's also less likely to throw off the pH than most other lubes, and there are thousands of doctors recommending Uber Lube to their patients, whether they want to make their hot sex even hotter or for folks experiencing dryness. Uber Lube is without a doubt my favorite lube. It has no flavor, no scent, and feels absolutely amazing on my body. And it isn't just for sex. I use it to tame my hair frizzies, to prevent chafing, and I even put some in my mouth before an oral sex session. Totally ups my blowjob game. Oh, and the bottle, it's beautiful. It looks like a cosmetic product. So I just leave it out on my nightstand totally shamelessly. To learn why we think it's the best lube on the planet, check out uberlube.com and use code SHAMELESSSEX for 10% off plus free shipping. Again, that's uberlube.com and use code SHAMELESSSEX for 10% off and free shipping. Go check it out. Now back to the show. 
I know, uh, like April was saying that sometimes we're, we're trained to avoid conflict, but I think also a lot of uh, couples think that there is something like the goal is to not have conflict at all. And if yeah. they do, there's a big problem. And instead it's yeah. more about, yeah, which is not helpful. And I've actually, I mean, I've seen this in a, in a lot of people and I, and clients I've had been in partnerships where that was the case where like, wh- why are we here? We shouldn't be here. This means there's something wrong here. Yeah. Instead of like, this is a part of being in a relationship with anyone. Even April and I will have conflict. We're actually... Yeah surprisingly uh, I've always been really skilled at dealing with our conflict we've had a couple big blowouts but I'm still avoidant she'll be can we talk about this I'm like "Mm, I'm like maybe (laughs) (laughs) I'm still like do we have to (laughs) I'm usually the one that I'm usually the one that approaches people is like so what's going on yeah I can tell there's something going on here nice Um, and I you know I had to learn how to do that but it's just it's just a part of relationship with friends family and partners too and you got it um, yeah I think it's helpful to embrace that yeah we're we're um we're going to not get along. And if you, in fact, I think the better relationships we have, the more likely we're going to get into conflict and the better and stronger we become when we work through it. So it's always an opportunity. I'm with you. Let's embrace it. And I think people purchase a fantasy in relationships that says no conflict equals good relationship. And I think that's just bullshit. Unless you want to lock yourself in a cave and not talk to anyone ever again, right. you're going to have conflict, right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Which sometimes looks really nice to me. I'm like, maybe I'll just lock <laughs> yeah. myself in I want that <laughs> island sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Where can yeah. I go where there's no yeah. people? Let's go yeah. there. I just don't like, want one person. i bring my dog, though. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Right. I get conflict with him, too. Damn it. <laughs> what about, so can we t- ask about codependence here? So I was listening to your podcast the other day and I listened to an episode that was talking about codependence and it was saying that there can be some maybe positives in codependence, although there's often a shadow side there. And I used the term codependent-ish. Um, and April and I have talked about this. We're like, yeah, we have some codependent stuff. I and My mom has some codependent stuff and, um, and I know a lot of it is about survival. And for me, there's um, abandonment issues and this mm-hmm. feeling of like, I, you know, I need, need to please and keep the peace because otherwise I might get left and then I'm alone and then I'll die. And, yeah, um, exactly. Can you, explain, you got kind of <laughs> describe to our listeners what is codependence? How does it show up? How does it serve us? How does it get in our way? Well, you, you just explained it pretty nicely there. Amy, about, <laughs> I'm dying. Um, yeah. <laughs> in terms of what drives it, right? Like yeah. a, a codependent-ish type person, I like, I like the word ish because it can be such a strong label people put on themselves or each other. And codependent-ish is like, yeah, it's a spectrum. I tend to, usually as a kid, most of us uh, were the helper in the family for whatever reason, alcoholic mom, depressed dad, brother that was sick. Something was going down in the family that had this person start to caretake others and then receive value from that and also love from that. And then that turns into an adult who finds themselves with a partner who might need help or isn't doing the work or won't own their part. And so the codependent-ish person starts to try to help uh, because that's their impulse and that's what they're good at and they just want to help. And then they believe in people's potential versus who they are in reality. And so they'll keep trying and trying and trying and hoping that if I just make this one tweak and I just do this one little thing over here, then I'll get my needs met and it'll feel fair and equal. Um, And codependent-ish people also set the relationships up usually as an unfair dynamic where I help you, but you don't help me. Oh man, yeah. I feel like I'm yeah. Yeah, I'm times. I'm textbooked right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think the ish was added to be nice. I think it's just codependent. Well, what's what is the <laughs> right. ish? What does the ish mean to you? Is it like it just means a spectrum? Like, um, okay. it, it's sort of like I'm co- I'm codependent ish because not in my marriage, but in my work. Like, I'll I'll give and serve till I bleed, right? And then I'll for- completely forget about myself. I'll be like, oh shit, I gotta shower. I gotta like lay down and like eat something here. And that's, that's sort of the same flavor of like, again, I'll help you and maybe you won't help me, but I don't care because I'm just going to, this feels good. This is what I'm used to. And this is what I know. So I'm just going to keep helping. I never thought of it this way, actually. So you're just blowing my mind right now a little bit. I thought codependence was something else. I had it defined in my brain as something that I, I I knew that I was, but I was like, no, it's something I could get out of. But I do this a lot with a lot of folks, not even Mm. just in relationship, but like in partnership, but in, in, um, various relationships. So that's, that's something I have to work on. So let's maybe talk about that in another podcast because it's a good, but what do you do though? Oh yeah. That's what I'm saying. What, What do I do? Well, let's talk about what to do. <laughs> Read this for us. This is nice, about us. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Let's talk about what to do, but let's also remember that this is a strength. This is a very positive quality. We don't need to make this quality about you or me or anyone wrong. Um, 
there's, there's tremendous health in this. And where it becomes frustrating is in agonizing usually is in partnerships where again, I'm doing the work and I like to use a boat metaphor. If our boats are tied together and that's called a partnership, we're out in the middle of the ocean and you're laying down in your boat and I'm paddling in my boat on the right side and you're sitting on the left side and I'm the only one paddling, we're going to go in a circle. And at a certain point, we're not having very much fun anymore because wait, I know I want to go out there and I, I just can't continue to paddle while you do nothing. Um, and that's an extreme example. Uh, usually that's not, it's not that extreme, but it just paints the picture that, right, the, the codependent-ish person is often just busting their ass to try to make things work in the relationship. And usually that leads to resentments, burnout. Um, it can lead to the other person feeling judged and criticized because they always want to be changed. You're trying to change me. You're trying to get me to be who you want me to be. Um, you know, and, and there's just, it's not ultimately fulfilling for both people. But it kind of works, right? Or at the other person. Yeah. What do you yeah. yeah? What do you do? Do you sink the other boat? What do you <laughs> <laughs> use your fucking oar? Why aren't you get using your out there? Oar? Exactly. With your you, you shame them. You shame them yeah. and you cut you their use your oar. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> you cut you, the line. <laughs> you cut the line and you're like, I'm done with this relationship. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I don't think that's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not what you do. But again, <laughs> I often find I often find that as the codependent-ish person can start valuing themselves, they start to see, wait, I deserve to be met here. I deserve some mutuality. I deserve to be attended to. I deserve to, um, and my edge is to receive love but and receive someone giving to me because I'm always giving. So I deserve that, and I now can start to almost expect that. It can be a growing edge to begin to expect that I help you and then it comes back to me. You help me also. And it's like a figure eight, like it's this infinity sort of thing. Like we help each other and it feels really nice. So it's not going to be set up like, well, I do this, 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 and this, and this, and you do nothing. It's like you have to sort of uh, have, a, have the conversations and then create the foundation, right? Where it's, uh, it's sort of the blueprint of what you, uh, want and expect in the relationship. Uh, almost like an architect would draw blueprints to a, to a, a building. Is this what yeah. you're speaking to? I like that. I like that a lot. I, I'd say before that, there's a move I didn't mention, which is I need to be really okay with, if I just take my foot off the gas of my helping and my habit of kind of trying to make you change or whatever, if I take my foot off the gas and just sit here and feel, I'm going to feel some pretty terror, terrifying and uncomfortable feelings that I have been avoiding feeling. And the more I can get okay with, wow, this is scary for me. Cause like you said, Amy, it's like, I'm going to lose relationship, right? If I actually stop, take my foot off the gas here, this person will leave or I won't get the love that I want here. Uh, so being with, again, our pain, our discomfort, our fear is, is huge because then I, I have increased capacity to continue to set boundaries, which is another big thing for codependent-ish people. Saying no to people, no thank you, actually, no, I'm not going to keep giving. Um, I'm tired. I'm going to take care of myself now. I'm going to do something for me, actually, for once. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to try to pursue relationships where people actually reciprocate and do things for me also. Boundaries. That's genius. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. genius. Are you taking notes over here, Chip? Uh, I'm definitely going to listen to this <laughs> podcast about 200 times after well, we're what, finished recording it. What I imagine about you two in, in your relationship is that it's not codependent-ish because there's there's a, you're helping each other out, right? So you have a probably a living example that shows you what's possible in, in just your friendship or whatever's happening here, you know? Yeah, and I think we show up for each other in uh, the same ways and also in different ways. And, and I guess that was that's a question I'll ask right. you here, too, is I, I also I feel like sometimes people are trying to do tit for tat or like I do these five things. So you mm -hmm. have to do these five things. And that in itself is also problematic. It's like trying to make it not like too mutual, but like e completely even. Yeah. Or, the um, laundry list, though, yeah, is never great. That's something right. that's always kind of bugged me. I'm yeah. like, whoa, yeah, yeah like, I, like, like give, don't give to get right at the yep. same time. State your boundaries. I like I like that. I don't give to get. I'm not like, well, I did this and I'll expect you to, I don't, I just don't think that's a successful story. Yeah. And it's coming from resentment. Usually yeah. that kind of scorekeeping is usually it's a sign of there's resentments in the relationship. And I like what you said also there that it's not, um, I'm a, because I'm wired differently than you and I give differently than you. It doesn't need to look the same coming back. You know, maybe your way of giving to me is to be the provider and you're 
the breadwinner in our family and you make us all this cash and that's how you show love to me. If that works for both of us, that's, that's fine. That can be, that can feel really fair to some couples and some people. Yeah. But again, a business partnership, I think is an interesting place to look at this. It's like, are we both pulling our weight? You know, it's a simple conversation. And, and sometimes one person is doing more than the other. And again, that doesn't work over time. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I work more and April just gives me wine. So it works really well. <laughs> oh, you guys are sweet. I need a business partner like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> well, there's other things that I do. She does a lot more. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's not all she does. I was just being funny. Oh, that's yeah. why I love you. You're funny. You're um, funny. So let's talk about, because I feel like a lot of these things that we've addressed within the codependency um, that a relationship can can get into um, can create conflict. So let, and we've talked a little bit about inner conflict and outer conflict, but what do you think, in your opinion, are the most common types of fights that couples specifically get into? Yeah, uh, there's five that I identify. Surface fights, that's the fighting about the little stuff, which usually is a tributary to much bigger stuff. There's value differences, right? Mm-hmm you like vaccines, I don't like vaccines type of thing or Ooh, religious beliefs or <laughs> where to put the kids into school, et cetera. Yeah, that one gets intense. Um, value differences <laughs> is big and can tear people apart, um, even in businesses. Um, you know, it's a different direction, right? Uh, security fights, which is like attachment or attachment dynamic. Do I actually feel safe here? And like you have two feet in? Because imagine if April had one foot in and one foot out and your dynamic here, that would feel unsafe, right? At a certain point, it's like, uh, I can't keep proceeding here. And you guys would be fighting about that all the time. Every service fight would kind of come back to that. Um, and then there's projection fights, which is like you project dad or mom onto me. I project, you know, historical figures onto you. Um, is that all? Did I mention them all? Yeah, well, is there, are there, are there ones one with a breach of trust? Because trust is one like that, is that, does that align with another? Security. Oh. Secu- yeah, that's the security one. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's yeah, a huge you, you one for just, a lot of couples. Oh yeah. You just breached the security when you sent that text to so-and-so or you're like flirting with that old Facebook, you know, high school friend or whatever that can again, really feel, have someone feel on guard and unsafe and break the, or hurt the trust or impact the trust in the relationship for sure. And are there ways to rebound from these different breaches or the common types of fights always, that are always okay. Good. Yeah. Then there's hope. There, the, there's always hope. The only time there's not hope is when we're with an incredibly defended person who will not take responsibility for anything. Some people could call that a narcissist. It doesn't matter. It's just someone who will not own their side ever. And they just stonewall gaslight and they do all kinds of behaviors that will not any, that's just really mean. Um, that doesn't work. But if you're with someone who's reasonable and who actually will be like, yeah, I did kind of, I was kind of a jerk last week or last night. And then, then we've got pretty much anything's possible if someone is willing. What if that person, and this is not my current relationship, everyone, um, but what if that <laughs> person <laughs> is, they don't admit it later that night, they don't admit it later that week, but they admit it a year later. After the breakup? <laughs> yeah, general. No, sometimes it's way later, oh, like okay. many months later. Again, I'm not speaking to my current relationship. But yeah. I mean, in, in that case, it still is like, you know, it's a, it's it's like they're, or almost like they wait until it's, it's super it's fucked yeah. to see yeah. that, okay, right. now I need to see my own pieces. Like that still is like, how, what do you do with that? Well, I was going to say, when you first started talking, you waited too long to advocate for yourself and didn't advocate strongly enough. So Hmm. repair takes two people. If there's a snag, a breach of trust, whatever it is, and the person doesn't own it um, then, and you're still feeling it not zero, your your nervous system is still unsettled, you got to keep advocating for like, hey, I'm still not quite there. And then the person, this, this type of person usually wants to roll their eyes and call you too sensitive, too emotional, too whatever, right? And that's not cool either because that's, again, blaming you for just feeling like, hey, I'm not there yet. I need a little more ownership. I need a little more time here for us to work through this conflict. So I would say advocate much, much sooner and in a, in a way the other person, like have your own back, right? Does that make sense? And so, and yeah, mm-hmm. totally, hundred percent. And mm-hmm. so, do you think that whenever there's a conflict, so they, one of these fights um, or some sort of conflict, there's you know, say there's two people, whether it's April and I, and as business partners or a couple, that um, 
one, this is, I'm just going to throw it out there and I might agree with it. Um, that one helpful idea or tool would be that everyone has some sort of ownership. Maybe it's one more than the other, but in some way, shape or form, we all have yeah. something to own and that we could probably go about every fighter argument and say, all right, I have a piece here. What is it? Would that be helpful? Oh, you're speaking my language. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> personal responsibility goes a long way and it always takes two to tango and there's it's rarely, if ever, one way or one-sided. Um, even if there's an affair, people love to blame the person who cheated. And it's like, no, it always there's always a part for the person that got cheated on. And if they can get out of their victim position and start taking responsibility for, yeah, I didn't show up for them. I was kind of aloof. I ignored them. I didn't attend to them sexually. I, you know, there's all kinds of, of reasons why... Um, and it, again, it's not about blaming anybody. It's just, can I own that I probably contributed to this situation unfolding the way it did? And man, that's an, a very adult thing to do. And I think it's empowerment. Like I want to, I want to be empowered in life. I don't want to be pointing the finger at people. There's a piece about apologies, though, and taking responsibility because there's an art to apologizing. An art meaning oh, yeah. it's it's not. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way, which is a thing that Oof. drives me crazy because I'm like, yo, 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 that's not right. cool. Like, take responsibility for your piece, and I, I'm don't don't thank you for for your sorry, but that seems like a little bit detached from the reality of the situation. What what are you actually sorry for, right? And I think this is something that's really difficult for people because I hear all the time, even in in friendships, where uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm like, oh, what? A, I, fuck you. This is why. Yeah, I, fuck I, you. This is why. Fuck I you is a yeah. really good response <laughs> to that. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so invalidating, you know? Yeah. So what we can say instead is, so April, you and I, let's say we're in a relationship and I fucked up. I can say, uh, instead of saying, I'm sorry, which is one, one way. And if I'm sorry really worked for your nervous system and I knew that about you, I would use it. I would use it every time because it works for you. But before I said, I'm sorry, I would say this, Hey, um, I know yesterday we had that snag and I, I'm just, I've been thinking about it and I think how I treated you wasn't cool. And I can see that um, when I raised my voice like that or I didn't text you back, I can see, I remember the look on your face and I can imagine that that felt really hurtful. And, you know, it just sucks that I uh, did that. And I see the impact on you and I'm just really feeling kind of sad and bummed that I did that to you. And if I want to throw in the ap apology, I can, right? I mean, how would that feel? Right. So much better. Yeah. And I, I'm not prone to loving apologies. I dig re taking responsibility and saying, hey, I fucked up and um, I can see that you're hurt and uh, l let's get into repair. How can we go there? I don't really, it, I always say it like in business and in relationships, like give yourself nine solid apologies that you really, really mean, you know, like nine lives because yeah. like take responsibility for your actions and say, please excuse my behavior and go from there. Right. Um, and I really love that though. That is so great. And I know you're married, but damn, everybody out there, take some notes from Jason. <laughs> this is why you have a book an amazing podcast because you really know what you're talking about. You're so it just skilled at the art and your delivery. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm learning yeah. so much from this. I don't ever want you to get off this podcast that we're doing right now. We're going to keep you forever. Right on. <laughs> right on. Well, it's, it's nice. Thanks for saying that. And, you know, my wife, if she was sitting right here, she'd say, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because I can be a total ass and I can forget to empathize. And so she keeps me really sharp because I, my, actually my biggest weakness is probably empathy where mm -hmm. I forget that part. Like, Oh fuck, I could see that hurt your feelings. And whew, can we just like have a breath there? Um, I'm usually like, yeah, I already own my part. Like what, what, what <laughs> doesn't Sounds work like me kind of. Yeah. Well, yeah. and a lot of it is easier said than done, especially when we are in the trigger mode or you know, I can give all of the, the tips on you know sex and relationships to people. But when I'm in it, it is more challenging generally, not on For everything, sure. but it often is. It depends on the dynamic, too. So and, I, you know, my, my favorite teachers and educators are the ones that are like, I'm still learning. I'm not perfect. Yeah. Here's my stuff. The ones who are yeah. like, oh, no, I got this all figured out. I'm like, I don't trust them. I don't know about yeah. that. These are all pieces to the jigsaw, too, because if you're triggered, right, you can't get to that place, though. I mean, if you're triggered, yeah. can you empathize if you're in a triggered state in a, in, in relationship? Usually, usually not. I, ha I need a few minutes or hours to get to the place where I'm like, got it. I, I can soften enough to be like, imagine being her or in someone else's shoes. And then I'm like, okay, I can do that. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, in the moment, again, in the moment, it's not easy. And I, I don't want that to be the bar for people that somehow you're going to do all this stuff in the moment. It's as soon as possible mm-hmm. is like the rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But also like yeah, not and, necessarily and a 24 rushing hour, over. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say just not rushing and overriding things too. It's like as soon as possible when we're there probably. Yeah. I mean, we can, when you work on yourself, you can get more of a handle on your reactivity. But I found that you know, if you are a voice raiser or you're a blamer or whatever, that's hard to change, but you can make traction there. You, you can actually get better at doing it less or doing it less meanly or for sure. But again, where the, where the rubber meets the road is how quickly did you come back around and own your part and empathize and listen until the other person feels understood and, you know, come back to a good place again and validate their experience, et cetera. The voice so, raisers. That's a good that's, one. Oh, the voice, yeah. Or the blamers. What yeah. are you? I am a, what are the other ones? Voice raiser. Blamer. The shutter downers, the distancers. The I'm the shutter downer. I'm the shutter downer and the <laughs> okay. distancer. I'm like, I'm not th- like, I'm uh-huh. never going to talk to you again. I'm not that kind of person. I'm I'm I have friends that are like that yeah. where they're just like, yeah. we've been into a fight and she sent me an email saying, uh, I guess you're done with me. Uh, like, let's never talk again. I was like, we've been friends for like 20 years. We, yeah, you're what? Like, what? like, this is right. over. What? So it's like, uh, but I, yeah. I feel like the, I'm a shutter downer where I just freeze. But I, uh, uh, yeah, I've been are in you a shutter, relationship. Is the shutter down shutting them down or you're shutting down? Oh, you're shutting call. down. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm not, so that's a, the shutter downer yeah. is like, I just kind of shut down, which is another way of just, I kind of go into my hermit crab shell. Mm. I disassociate. Well, I'm just, I'm just I, yeah. Body. You know, yeah. Like a, right. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the eyes get all glossed over and you can, and yeah. I can feel it happening. And it actually, but like, there's a part of me that sometimes I can't ch- not, not choose it. And sometimes I am choosing it cause it's, it's so familiar. I mean, I've been doing that often all my whole life, but all around abandonment though. It's like it, you, in the r- voice raising to me, I can handle if someone raises their voice. They can have a big old loud tantrum over there and stomp and even say some mean things. Totally fine, but the minute they're like, "I'm leaving," oh, I'm I'm freaking out uh, inside. Okay. <laughs> it's that, that, yeah, that so that's is, when yeah. you is that more when you dissociate is when someone exits. Yes, yeah, it's completely or even if they're or if they even they Silence. can still be there and energetically exit too. Like they yeah. can still be with me, and yeah. then they're putting up a wall or something. Or but if there's a threat to um, them leaving or at the end of the relationship, there my response is a disassociative response. Yeah, um, and which is um, and it takes so long to bounce back from. It's yeah. not a fun one. I mean, I know yeah. it's there, survival, but yeah. it's yeah. Wait, it sounds like yeah. you use a lot of non-defensive communication techniques too. So, and your book, because we, we, I would love to hear a little bit more about your book because it's coming out October fifth, mm-hmm. and um, also about your podcast because for folks that haven't listened, it's an, an incredibly helpful tool out there that's for mm-hmm. all y'all about relation. I mean, it's it's incredible. So, can you talk a little bit more about your book? Are you going to cover a lot of the things that we talked about today, or more? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So the book's called Getting to Zero. Again, how to work through conflict in your high stakes relationships. And I'm really pumped about it. I feel awesome about it. It's really, I think, an, an excellent manual. It's very tactical. Uh, it's backed by some neuroscience and attachment science. So it's a little nerdy on a couple chapters if you care about that, just to understand the nervous system. But it's very street level. Like, how do we actually get to a better place? That's the entire purpose of the book. And that's kind of what we've been talking about today. And I talk about different styles of people, you know, the posture collapse, seek avoid dynamic. Um, I talk about values uh, and like why it's so conflict is this opportunity to help us actually get really clear in ourselves and stand in our values um, or abandon ourselves and create another inner conflict. So I think it's pretty fun. It's pretty dynamic. I, I tell a lot of personal stories in it about my own foibles and failures and fuck ups, which I think is helpful for people. That's awesome. And that's, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting that book immediately. Is it going to be on all the platforms or is it directly yep. going to be on, uh, your website and also your podcast? Can you talk about that just a little bit too, Jason, please? Yeah, sure. And thanks for listening. Um, that's cool mm-hmm. that you guys listen. It's called the relationship school podcast. Now it used to be called the smart couple as these ladies pointed out and, um, you know, hundreds of episodes, uh, just with awesome leaders and, um, couples and my wife and I a lot, uh, myself, uh, it's been a journey for sure. And I think there's just a lot of good nuggets in there for you to change your life here relationally if you want. And you also have a relationship school. Is this right? 
That's right. Um, so I founded the relationship school cause I was tired of complaining about how this isn't taught in, you know, high school or college. And it's like sex ed, right? It's like, I got this much sex ed and then I was a disaster sexually. I mean, that, that'd be a whole nother podcast for us to record. <laughs> <laughs> I need to interview you guys actually. Yeah. That's <laughs> our topic. We can do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, anyway, I, yeah. And I, I am just committed to helping people learn this because people either, they, they posture a collapse. They think they know how to do relationship and conflict and then they get married and they get into a business partnership and they don't, and they get shown by life that they don't. And then they're, if they're stubborn, they don't want to learn. If they're humble and they're honest and they're an awesome person, they're like, yeah, I, okay, I got something to learn here. And they come to the relationship school to learn. So, uh, you know, one of our missions is to reach a million teens. I, I just want this in schools. I want people to get this because I think our world would be a little, I don't know, a little cooler if we could work mm-hmm. our shit out. As Jason, as you say, hell yeah. I like when you say, hell, hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Right? I hell agree. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. I love this so much. I took away so many things. I can't wait to get your book because when we're recording this, obviously it's unavailable yet. But um, to all y'all out there, go check out that book and please check out Jason's podcast too. I think you'll uh, love it as much as we have because it's yeah, you have so many episodes. I mean, you'll, you're bound to find something in there that is uh, going to speak to you. And that's not even, again, not even to, towards partnership, towards relationship, which we're mm. all in, unless you live in that cave or on the desert island. Sorry for you. Oh. Tools for relationship with yourself, I'm sure, though. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah. Thing too. yeah, yeah. Right. Why not? That matters. That matters. Totally. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jason. And um, thank you to all of our Shameless Sex listeners out there. I can't leave an episode of Shameless Sex without talking about, yes, sex. We already did that. But about Margins Wine. I'm not drinking Margins Wine now because Amy and I are on a detox for a little while. Damn. We're in it together. But when we do drink wine again, it will be Margins Wine because we love it so much. It's small boutique wine. It's made in small batches. Uh, she takes underrepresented varietals of grapes, meaning they're pretty uncommon from underrepresented regions uh, here locally and from Santa Cruz, California. And there are three releases a year. So go check it out. Go to marginswine.com, sign up for the newsletter, and you can check out the coupon codes on our website. That's shamelesssex.com. <sighs> this was a nice episode. I feel like my brain got bigger. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's popping out of her It's head. popping out of my head right now. So oh, hell yeah. Uh, if you're tuning on YouTube, hi. Hey. Hi. We'll see you again next Tuesday for another episode of Shameless Sex, y'all. Mwah. We love you. Ciao for now. Want to learn more? Go to shamelesssex.com. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use code shamelesssex at purepleasureshop.com.